again thank God for this tremendous honor to speak for him. I really, really appreciate it. There's no higher calling than to represent God. And so I thank him for it. And my commitment to God is to do my very best to present the truth and to keep my opinions and my feelings completely out of the equation because they cannot help you. But the word of God will change your life. It really will. It will shock you the degree to which God's word will change your life. You know, Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1, the scriptures are the primary agency in the transformation of character. God uses this more than anything else to change the person. And she goes on to say, if studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute, every single one. The word of God, if studied and obeyed. By the way, uh, the quotation I gave you this morning the consciousness of right doing is the best medicine for diseased bodies of mind is uh, Helpful Living, page 233, paragraph 7. I think I told you 433, page 233. So if you've had a headache trying to find it, that's the reason. Okay, and the one I just gave you is Christ Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. The scriptures are the primary agency in the transformation of character. If you want to change your thinking, meditate on God's word. Read it meditate on it. You know what a righteous man does in Psalm, 100 verse, Psalm 1 verse 2? And in his law doth he meditate, how often? Day and night. As you think of God's word, it will change your mind. Let me also tell you this. Don't avoid difficult Bible passages. Try to understand them. There's something, I love going to the gym, I love lifting weights. And there's something called isometric contraction. What it simply means is you apply a muscular force against a, a, a resistance that doesn't move. For instance, let's say this desk weighs 2,000 pounds, and I try to lift it, the desk doesn't move, but something happens in my musculature. The muscles I use to attempt to move it will change even though the object does not move. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, there are some Bible verses, they're like a wall, they don't move. They seem to be difficult. Don't avoid them, try to understand even if you think you have not, something will change in your mind because you've applied a mental force against that object and something will change in your mind. The muscles of your mind will grow strong. So I repeat, do not make the self-destructive error of avoiding what we consider to be difficult Bible passages. Make an effort and God will reward your attempt. Okay. Before I begin, do three favors for me. Favor number one, what's that? All right, phones off and Bibles turned on. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I think of what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 12. And God said to Moses, now therefore go, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. By the way, let me go into one of my customary digressions. People always make excuses why they can't serve God. Now in verse 10 of Exodus 4, uh, Moses said to God, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. That was his excuse for not wanting to go to Pharaoh. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Moses complained about his mouth and his tongue. God said, who hath made man's mouth? And goes on to say, or oh, who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? What is God saying? If there's something wrong with your mouth, why you can't serve me, I can fix it. Why? Because I made it. By the way, you can extend that to who hath made man's blood vessels? Who hath made man's skin? Who hath made man's arteries? Who hath made man's liver? God could have gone down the anatomical list. Because everything that goes wrong, he can fix. Are you with me? Well, somebody say amen. amen. So I know I'm not in a cemetery. All right. Favor number three, think while you listen. Think. Are you with me? How many of you have been thinking? Can I see your hands? All right, some of you need prayer. Okay. Think, my brethren, you know, it's, let me digress again. You know, that's what separates us from the animals. 
the capacity to think and reason. You take that away and we are no different from the animals. As a matter of fact, when that is not used, we act like animals. And Ella White embarrassingly writes, some animals use their gifts more faithfully than we do. She writes that. So please think as you listen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the joy of speaking for you. Thank you, Lord, for the pleasure of speaking to those who love you and love your word. Now I ask you, Father, where I've offended you, forgive me. Stand by my side in the person of your spirit and help me. Hide me behind the cross of Christ and let only his voice be heard and the beauty of Christ be seen. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl, every family they got under the sound of my voice. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let's go to Romans 13, where our theme is taken. Romans 13, reading from verse 11, when you found it, say Amen. amen. All right, you read for me. What does it say? Amen. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is what? Our salvation nearer than when we believe. Read the next verse. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us what? Put on the armor of light. Now, the verse says, let us therefore cast off what? The works of darkness. What are the works of darkness? Let's read the next verse. What does it say? Let us walk how? Honestly, as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness or chambering on wantonness or strife or envying. Read the last verse of that chapter. But let us put on what? The Lord Jesus Christ. Finish the verse. Make not provision for the flesh. Go on to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, what are we called to put off? Knowing the time in which we live, what are we called to put off? Give me one word, sin. So what we read in the, the next to the last verse are merely examples and the list is not complete. We are told knowing the time in which we live, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. And the armor of light in Romans 13 is no different from the armor that Paul presents in Ephesians chapter 6. All right. So we're told, cast off sin. By the way, the responsibility for getting rid of sin is yours and mine. Let me say that again. Well, I don't want to lean forward all that. Hold this in my hand. The responsibility, if you will, for getting rid of sin, for casting it out of the soul, is the work of the sinner. But the power that allows the sinner to do that is the power of God. Thank you, my good sister. Blessings on you. We're to cast off the works of darkness, put on the arm of light. Now, let's leave that point. We'll come back to it. We need to find out now how we cast off the works of darkness, how we put on the arm of light. Now, our example in all things good is Jesus Christ. If I'm correct, say amen. amen. All right, let's take a look at Christ and see what the Bible says about him in his role as the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. Let us go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We read verse 24 of 1 Peter chapter 2. We're looking at Christ, how he is described as the ultimate sinner, the sin bearer, and the ultimate sinner. Do you have 1 Peter 2, verse 24? Read it with me. What does it say? Who his own self bear our sins where? In his where? Own body. Come on. On the tree. Where did Christ carry our sins? In his own body on the tree. The tree refers to the cross. I want you to reflect on that. Now, where am I wearing this coat? Where? On my body. Now, if this is sin, where should I wear it? In my body. That's where Christ took our sins in 
to himself. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible says. Now, let's read it one more time. Who his own self bear our sins where? In his own body on the tree. Okay. Let us go to 2 Corinthians 5. Let's read verse 21. Our subject, direction is everything. Read with me if you have the King James Version. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Read that verse again, nice and slow. For he who is he? God the Father hath made him who is him? Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, we know who us is, that we might be made, what? The righteousness of God in him. Now, there is a, this verse represents a balanced equation. It also causes problems for some people who, with all good intentions, try to separate Christ from humanity. They don't want Christ to be too human out of respect for him. But by so doing, they endanger our eternal salvation. Let me explain. Listen again. I'll read it. You listen. Who? For he hath made him to be what? Sin. Now, the end of that verse says that we might be made what? Righteousness. Now, let me reverse that. As verily as we are made the righteousness of God through Christ... So verily was Christ made the sin of man. If you weaken Christ being made sin, you have to weaken sinners who come to Christ being made the righteousness of God. Now, you're not with me. I'll say it again. You have to think. You have to listen. Listen carefully to the verse. For he hath made him to be sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have two things, two being made. God made him sin, we're made righteous. They are equal in the sense that as much as we're made righteous, so was Christ made sin. Are you with me? Okay. Now, you'll observe the verse said, Christ was made sin. It never said that Christ sinned. Are you with me? So whatever sin he was made, it was not natural to him. Are you with me? As verily as the righteousness we are made is not natural to us. Amen. <laughs> okay. But I want more amens than that. <laughs> is anyone confused? Raise your hand. Ah, there must be two or three. Good. Sister, God bless you. You're honest and good looking. That's nice. Anybody else? Confused? Okay, my brother, God bless you. Handsome man. Anybody else confused? All right, listen again. Okay. We have the population of confused people increasing. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Listen to the verse. I tell you what. Let's pray. Dear God, this issue is critical. We must understand. And I'm human, I'm weak. Intensify whatever help you're giving me from above. Help me to remember simplicity is power. Now speak through me, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's approach it from this side. Let us go to John 14. John 14. We read verse 30. We're trying to understand... 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Let's go to John 14. We read verse 30. John is my second favorite book. What question should you ask me? Yes, it's Genesis. All right, sister, you're sharp. All right, John 14, do you have verse 30? Amen. Read with me. What does it say? Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, finish the verse, and hath nothing in me. What did Jesus mean by that? There was no sin in him. There was nothing the devil could point to, no hook upon which he could hang one of his whatever. He couldn't do it. Let us go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll read verse 21. 1 Peter 2 verse 21. Jesus said in John 14, 30, the devil has nothing in me. 1 Peter 2 verse 21 and verse 22. 
Read with me. What does it say? For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should do what? Follow his steps. Now verse 22, clearly, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Here again, we have the second witness. Christ did not sin. Yet, he was made sin. So whatever he was made was not natural to him. Is that clear? Now, we, let's read about us. You, you can know this verse without looking. Jeremiah 79, read with me without looking. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Meaning, not even I am aware of how wicked I can be. Are you with me? Another verse which you know quite well without looking, Romans 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. Keep going. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Neither indeed can be is similar to who can know it in Jeremiah 79. Jeremiah 13, 23. Read with me. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? or the leopard his spots, then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Job 14 verse uh, 4, I believe it is. Who can bring what? A clean thing out of an unclean, not one. Now, we're described as what? Give me one word. Sinful evil. Christ is described how? Sinless. Yet, this sinless person took into him what? Our sin. How is that possible? How can Christ say, I am sinless, yet the Bible says he was numbered with the transgressors. Ellen White writes that his position between the two thieves symbolized he was the worst of the three. Isaiah says, Isaiah 53, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was regarded as one of them. Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from what? The curse of the law, go on, being made what? A curse for us. Who made him a curse? The Father. The Father poured out on Jesus what should have been poured out where? On us. Okay. The question remains, how then was it possible for us to be able to say we have a sinless Savior? Let's go to uh, Mark. Our subject, direction is everything. How can someone who took sin into himself be a sinless Savior? Amen. Let's read together. And he said what? Yes. That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Keep reading. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, go on. Thefts, covetousness, go on. Wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Finish the verse. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. All right. Keep this in mind. Now, when Christ talks about defilement, the same story is repeated in Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 15 and see Matthew presenting the very same thing. Matthew 15, we'll read from verse 1. Our subject, direction is everything. We're told, based on our theme, knowing the time, now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. We're told to cast off the works of darkness. We're looking at that. Matthew 15, reading from verse 1. Read with me. Then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Come on, read. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Stop. Can that lead to sickness? Yes. Can you get sick by handling food without washing your hands? Yes. But is it a sin? No. At least not if you do it accidentally. If you do it deliberately to hurt somebody, then you're in trouble. But eating with dirty hands does not defile the soul. So the defilement Christ is about to talk about is not the defilement that comes from lack of hygiene. He's referring to the defilement of sin. Are you with me? Go to verse 10. 
of Matthew 15. You said yes, one or two of you, but I'm not sure you're with me. Verse 10, do you have that? Read with me. What does it say? And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Now read 11 clearly. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the man, this defileth the man. So Christ is saying, eating a piece of bread with your dirty hands will not contaminate your soul. Are you following me? So the defilement we're stressing is not defilement physically, but defilement spiritually. All right. Keeping this in mind, now let us go to Leviticus chapter 1. We're still trying to explain how is it possible for Christ to have been made sin by the Father. What the Father does, he does very well. How is it possible that Christ could take our sins into himself and yet that same Christ can say that Satan has nothing in him and the Bible can say he was without blemish and without spot and it can be prophesied of him that he would be the righteous servant of the father we're in Leviticus chapter 1 what we're about to look at is the most fundamental of all the offerings and sacrifices in the Bible it is called the burnt offering is the most fundamental before all the items and the details of the sacrificial service were given to the Israelites in the wilderness. The, the, what Abraham and those before him had was, was very, not quite as uh, numerous as what those in the wilderness had. Let's go to Genesis 8. Let's read from verse 20. Genesis 8, reading verse 20. We are looking at the burnt offering, the most fundamental of the offerings in the Bible that typified the sacrifice of Christ. Genesis 8, we read verse 20. Genesis 8, verse 20, what does it say? And Noah, Noah built an altar, altar and, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered. Ah, uh, now he is right out of the ark. And what offering does he offer? A burnt offering. Let us go to Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said what? Behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, keep reading ladies, thine only son Isaac whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now Isaac was a burnt offering. We know Isaac represents whom? Jesus Christ. Christ, the burnt offering absolutely represents Christ because that offering was willing. It was not, you didn't have to, to, to offer that offering. It was totally willing. The others you had to bring, this one was entirely up to you. You know, Christ did not have to come and die for us. He came out of love. It was totally up to him. So we have the burnt offering. Now, while the offering Abel offered is not mentioned by name, but it clearly was also a burnt offering. Now, Paul tells us in Romans 12, verse 1, you know it without looking, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, come on, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. Paul tells us, offer yourself to God as what? A burnt offering. Total burnt offering, everything was consumed on the altar except the skin that was removed. All right, keeping this in mind now, now there were other offerings, of course, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the, the trespass offering, the sin offering, the, the, but those were, the fundamental one was the, the burnt offering. There was the drink offering also, but these were usually offered along with one of the five major offerings. The most important was burnt offering. All right, let's look at what the Bible says about the burnt offering. Leviticus 1, reading from verse 1. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying what? Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, he shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Keep reading. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Stop. What do you understand by a male without blemish? Jesus. Jesus without blemish represents what? His sinless condition. 
perfection. The sacrifice must be sinless without blemish. Keep reading. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. You see, that's the burnt offering. It's entirely up to you. At the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Go on. Before the Lord. Verse 4. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be what? Accepted for him to make atonement for him. Verse 5. And he shall do what? Kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and men you're dying on me. The ladies read more uh, loudly than you did. Now, let's look at some details. Let's go to verse 4 of Leviticus 1. Our subject, direction is everything. We're trying to understand how someone who took our sins into him, someone whom the Father cursed, someone described as being numbered with the transgressors, how is it that he can declare himself sinless? Read verse 4 of Leviticus chapter 1. All the members present, read for me. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. Stop. What does that mean? What does that mean? He shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt sacrifice. What does that mean? Sin is transferred. Okay, let's find that out from the Bible. Stay in Leviticus, go to chapter 16. We're looking at the great day of atonement. Leviticus 16. I hope you're thinking and praying as I speak. I really mean that. Too much worship is like a spectator sport. People just watch. You must always pray when someone is speaking. Always pray. Do we have Leviticus 16? Let's read verse 21. Read with me now. And Aaron shall do what? To lay both his hands upon what? The head of the live goat. Keep reading. And confess what? Over him. Uh-huh. All the iniquities of the children of Israel, go on, and all their transgressions and all their sins, go on. Okay, so this placing of the hand upon the head of the animal symbolized the transfer, the confession of sin. It goes from where? The sinner to the animal. Are you with me? Okay, all right, okay. I keep asking for a very good reason. It is pointless to proceed in the message if nobody's following you. You're just straining your voice. If you do not understand, raise a hand and say, wait a minute, preacher, I don't understand. I will consider that a favor to me. Are you with me? Now, let me ask you again. When the priest or the sinner place his hands upon the head of the burnt offering, what did that symbolize? The transfer of sin from whom? To whom? Yes, from the sinner to the sacrifice or from the sinner to Christ. Okay, now, how was the sacrifice described in verse 3? He shall bring it a male without blemish. Without blemish means what? Sinless. All right, now, he puts his hand on the head of what kind of sacrifice? A sinless sacrifice. What does the placing of the hand represent? The transfer of? When he has placed his hand, confessed his sin, and transferred his sin, is the sacrifice still sinless? No. Well, <laughs> all right. Let me get some more volunteers. Listen to me carefully. Is the sacrifice still sinless? All those who say it is no longer sinless, may I see your hand? Those who say it is now contaminated, let me see your hand. All right. If it's contaminated, what kind of sacrifice do we have? Well, if we don't have a sacrifice, you cannot have a sinful sacrifice. But what is transferred? Sin. Then how can all that sin be transferred onto the sacrifice, and the sacrifice remains sinless. Let the Bible explain that for us. Go back to Mark. Mark 7, verse 20, when you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. And he said, 
That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Keep reading. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts. Come on, read. Adultery, fornication, come on, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, come on, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Now finish, I think it's verse 23. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. What is our subject? Direction is everything. Now, the Bible or Jesus Christ lays down the direction in which defilement flows. How does it flow? From the inside, come on, out. I wish I could get you to talk to me. I feel like I'm in a time of trouble. In what direction does defilement flow? From the inside, out. Why is that? Go to Matthew chapter 12. Let's read verse 35. We'll read from 34 to 35 of Matthew 12. Chapter 12, verse 34. Read with me nice and loud. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? Stop. When you speak, in what direction do the words flow? From where? The inside out. Okay, keep listening to Christ now. How can ye being evil speak good things? Come on, finish the verse. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. The evil words come from where? Inside. The heart. And they flow out. Are you with me? Now verse 35. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart. Come on. Bring it forth. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bring it forth. So whether it's good or bad, where does it come from? Mm-hmm. Now, go back to Leviticus 1. Listen to verse 4 again. Now verse 3 and then verse 4. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, verse 3, he shall bring it what? A male, come on, without blemish. Now verse 4. And he shall do what? Put his hand upon the head of the... And it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. The placing of the hand symbolized the transfer of sin. Now, how is the sacrifice described? Come on quickly. Without blemish. Perfect. Here it is. Here comes the sinner now. In what condition is the sinner? He is sinful. He is contaminated. He places his hand upon the head of that sacrifice. What does that represent? The transfer of sin or defilement. The sin is defiled. The sacrifice is sinless, perfect, without blemish. Now the sinner has transferred his sins. He leaves in what condition? Right. Right. Where are the sins? They're not with him anymore. They're on the sacrifice, but his defilement traveled in which direction? From him, from within him to the outside, but with respect to the sacrifice, how does the defilement travel? From the outside in. But Jesus says for someone to be defiled, come on, it must travel how? From the inside out. Are you with me? Or are you with Jesus? Listen again. For there to be defilement, it must travel from the inside out. Christ can receive all the sins of the world and not be defiled. Why? Because that defilement, finish my words, travel, come on, from the outside in. Which means it is not your environment that makes you a sinner. So don't blame Canberra. Oh, to Rumbu Rumbu, where are my brothers from? <laughs> Don't blame your environment because it travels from the inside out. Jesus Christ, in his sinless condition, received all our sins but remained undefiled. Why? Because defilement does not travel from the outside in. It travels from the inside out. And so Christ says, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth from the inside. We're told now, knowing the time, we should put off the works of darkness. 
How do you put that off? There must be a change where? In the inside. That's why uh, I have a friend, he's a medical doctor. He makes a statement that riles up a lot of people. He says, eating cheese is sin. <laughs> now, is there sin in cheese, yes or no? No. Was there sin in the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No. What did God say? Don't eat it. What did Adam and Eve do? Before they physically sank their teeth into the fruit, what happened up here? A decision was made in here to disobey God. Sin begins in here and travels out. What we see outwardly is merely the consequence, the results of something that went wrong where? In here. So Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2, every act is judged by the motive. Where are the motives? On the inside. Where are the actions? On the outside. Direction is everything. Defilement travels from the inside out. Because of that, Christ could take our sins and remain undefiled because our sins travel to him from the outside in. He never made a moral choice to sin. Are you with me? Because that would have been from the inside out. Now, the other side of the spectrum, we cannot make a decision to be righteous. We're not righteous by decision, I should say. We are righteous by an action that happens externally and is credited to us. Are you following me? As verily as Christ was made sinful by something that happened externally and credited to him, but he himself remained, what's the word? Undefiled. Let me express it differently. As verily as the sin Christ took was not natural to him, so verily is the righteousness we receive not natural to us. It's, uh, to use the word, credited to us. It is attributed to us. It is imputed to us. It is not natural to us. And so we serve. We have a Savior who can legally pay the penalty for sin and yet remain undefiled, thus qualifying as a sinless, sympathetic Savior. And so when he went back to heaven, the father could accept the sacrifice because the sacrifice was perfect from beginning to end. No sin at any stage because nothing ever flowed from the inside out. All the defilement Christ took was from the outside in, but he himself remained, you tell me what? Undefiled, sinless. Why? Come on, why? Because defilement travels how? from the inside out and no defilement ever traveled from the heart of Christ out to none. All that he claimed to have taken came from the outside in. And so when you place your hand on the head of Jesus Christ symbolically and confess your sins, yes, up to this day, sins are placed on Christ. He remains sinless. The way I represent Christ taking our sins is a have you ever walked through a farm where there are cows and sheep? Do you step carefully? Why? Well, don't tell me, but you know why. You step carefully. Now, if perchance you step in it, what do you do? Yeah, so you find some grass. Are you with me? And you, or if you get to the house, you, you're given a what? A mat, and you're told to what? Wipe your feet. This world is a barnyard of dung. And from time to time, we step in it. Where does God send you to wipe your feet? On Jesus. Well, okay, yes. On Jesus. Wipe your feet. And so we go to Christ and we... Mm -hmm. Then five minutes later we step in it again. The Father says, go back. Go back. There's no other way. 
and right in his face. Look at your shoe, clean. Come on in. Enter thou, finish my words, into the joy of thy Lord, having wiped our feet on the face of Christ, the dung of sin. But he remains, what is it? Sinless. Why? And undefiled. Why? Because defilement travels from the inside out. And when he takes our sins, he takes something from the outside in. I thank God for the tremendous mystery of a God who became man, took all our sins, and yet remained and remains, what's the word? Sinless and undefiled. This is the hope of my salvation. On this, I can expect to be made righteous, even though righteousness is not natural to me. If you're with me, say amen. amen. All right, let's pray. First of all, how many want to say, Father, thank you for this amazing, simply amazing arrangement, the plan of salvation that allows my Savior to take my sin and still remain sinless. Who wants to say thank you to God for that? All right. Hands down, let's pray. Father in heaven, no one can fully, fully explain the way salvation works, but you've given us glimpses, glimpses bright enough, Lord, to really change our lives, to bring a flood of light into our darkened minds, and to generate from us, Lord, words of thanks and gratitude to you for this plan which only divinity could have devised. If I have spoken badly, forgive me, dear God. Help me to do better next time. You clarify what I've said in every mind, dear God. Help us never to forget, defilement flows from the inside out. Therefore, Christ can take our sins that came from the outside in and remain himself undefiled because he never chose to sin. We thank you for that. And Father, knowing the time, it is high time to awake from sleep. Father, let us, as we cling to Christ, cast off the works of darkness and put on the arm of light. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice, dear God. And when you come into your kingdom and we look into the face of Christ, no longer as a savior as such, but as a conquering king to claim those who put their faith in him. Father, may everyone in this place be found ready to receive their savior. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you in all that you do. The presentation you've been watching is available on DVD by visiting autumnleaves.co.nz or by calling 03-313-7762 to order. Thank you.